Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm Thomas Evelo. Um, I'm uh, the restorer of the mini MOA that's sitting out in the uh, display area. Well, here's the mini MOA in the condition that uh, we got it in. Um, it, uh, just a little brief history. It's a German glider built in 38, and it was imported into the UK. Um, by uh, Philip Brown, and it was in the UK until December of 40, and then it was imported into the US, and it reached the US basically January 1st of uh, 41, and then it pretty much flew most of the time uh, throughout the East Coast, and, uh, and it flew until basically 52 was the when they're actually the registration expired on it. And then it had not flown until uh, 21. So basically, basically 70 years that it, that it had been flown. And uh, I had to, in 2016, after Jerry Winger had purchased this, he had asked me to do the restoration on it. And I took a trip to Pennsylvania. I think it was Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania, to pick it up. And this is the condition that it was in. It's actually, structurally, it was in very good condition for how old it was and for how long it had been sitting. And it had been sitting on an open trailer this whole time, and it had been in and out of garages, barns, and hangars. And I believe the reason why it's in as good a condition that it's in is it was on an open trailer, so it could breathe, and it was kept indoors, which away from the elements, and even though it was a barn or a hangar, those buildings were able to breathe. So I uh, believe that's what saved this aircraft. If it was stuck in a trailer, set outside, I believe, especially in the east, I believe this would have fallen apart a long time ago. Um, so I have recovered aircrafts before that were stored outside in a trailer with the covering on it and everything. It locks all really nice until you put it together, you pull the covering off, and then it falls apart. And, uh, you can literally pull the whole thing apart without breaking anything because the glue literally turns to dust. And I believe that's uh, due to uh, being in a trailer that could not breathe and so you know, all the, the moisture and everything. And then that's also, you get a lot of rot. I've seen some that get a lot of mold in them and uh, wood rot. Here's the mini MOA in the shop. Um, to do a restoration, you don't need a shop of this size. I'm just fortunate enough to work in a shop of this size, which makes it uh, <laughs> uh, quite enjoyable, a heated shop. But it can be done in your garage, you know, if you do have interest on getting a vintage glider, it could be done in your garage. Um, you'd probably, one piece at a time, I'm sure. It just has to be long enough to where you can fit your wings in and be able to walk all the way around it. Um, and as far as woodworking tools, I do have lots access to lots of tools, good tools, but really a table saw, a band saw, and some hand tools is really all you need. You're just a uh, table saw for cutting the larger pieces of plywood and larger pieces of spruce, but otherwise you can cut stuff to length with a hand saw if you need it to a circular saw or a skill saw. So you don't need anything really expensive. So don't deter yourself thinking that this is what you need to do a restoration on one of these, because you really don't. And here's the fuselage, the, the paint, it was, uh, at least the nose of it was covered with fabric, which I believe they did that for actually uh, for aerodynamics. And there was a bit of filler in places on all of the seams. They added quite a bit of filler to basically during, especially during the 80s, because this, uh, it had, um, a couple of the owners had tried to do a restoration on it and got started and basically were a little overwhelmed on how much it was gonna take. 
So that's basically one thing with one of these projects, it takes a lot of time. But the key is to be persistent, um, like maybe start with a rudder, get that uh, finished, and it gives you a sense of accomplishment that you got one piece done, and then maybe move on to the horizontal or the elevator, you know, just do start out small. Uh, I suggest don't tear the whole thing apart all at once to where you have it all laying around all over because then it gets very overwhelming, overwhelming when you see it all scattered out, all tore apart, and then yeah, it's very easy to walk away from the project. The very first thing I actually do when I do get the project is I put it together. That's the very first thing I do because you don't want to do any work on anything unless you know it all fits together. And also, this is where you can see how your wings lined up, how your rudder fits, how everything. And you can see, because over time, depending how, how something is stored, even a wing, if it's leaning up against something, a wing can get, develop a twist. Um, even though nothing's broke, cracked, or anything, it's, it's wood. If it has any kind of weight against something over time, it will warp. So I put everything, assemble everything, make sure all everything fits, make sure it goes together good, and then make an assessment of what is damaged, and then you can go from there. Then here's uh, some of the repairs on the fuselage. Uh, where the pedo was, the plywood, it didn't really have any kind of a backer underneath the pedo, so it was just screwed into the plywood and it was cracked and damaged around it. So I've added some uh, backer blocks to actually screw into to prevent that in the future. And then on the wings here, the fuselage there, that is just a balsa wood. They just fared it with balsa wood. And so that is, as you know, balsa wood is very soft. And so I covered it with a sheet of um, fiberglass to help protect it. And then there's various um, holes in the fuselage here and there and bad repairs that then I uh, patched up. And I did have to replace the bottom of the fuselage because rodents got in it. So that's a big thing. If you do have them stored, check out them, keep an eye on them. Um, actually, just your um, your dryer sheets, set that inside there because the smell will deter the mice. So put them and change them out every once in a while because that will save you or someone else down the line a lot of work. Because it was, I had to wear a mask in order to work on this. It was so bad and you know, it was starting. It didn't rot all the way through, but as soon as you cut into it, it, yeah. You, you would have never been able to sit in this thing in the condition that it was in because you would pass out from the smell. And then at the tail there, um, where you could see kind of toward the back part of the tail, that's a big common place where a lot of people like to grab and haul the thing around. Well, it was broken back there. So if you do go to handle these wooden aircraft, do not grab them by the hole in the back, even though it's a nice perfect handhold, because it'll break. Um, and actually on this fuselage, you can't see it, but it actually has a tube that goes through uh, towards the back of the tail that's made for to put a pipe in to lift it and carry it around. And the other common thing is to grab it by the horizontal, lift it and move it around. And that's not a good thing either, because then you stand a chance of breaking the structure underneath and you damage your horizontal and stuff like that. If, if they have a place to grab it, it's best to grab it in that certain spot. And when and I do my restorations, I pull out every fitting that I can. So I will cut holes in places that, you know, it might be a perfect, perfect spot, but in order to get to the fittings, to, to remove them, you have to cut holes in your fuselage somewhere. So don't be afraid to cut a hole. It's easy to just scarf, put a patch in, but you really want to remove all your fittings because it's the only way to inspect them for cracks and if they're rusted, and then to be able to inspect the pulleys and everything. And a lot of times you have to clean them up anyway in order to get the pulleys to work properly. Um, so that's, that's why the, the tail is 
and I removed the top skin because I could have just patched in a little spot back where it was cracked, but I removed it so that I can remove all the fittings down inside. And here on the wings, you'll see a bunch of holes across the wings, and that's so that you can inspect your D-tube. And plus the mice had gotten in. Luckily, it must have just been where they ate because there was just nuts and this and just seeds and this and, and whatnot in there. There were no nests, luckily. And then, but it sounded like one of those uh, rain instruments every time you turned the wing around. So, um, but since I'm in it anyway to inspect it to make sure that uh, all your glue joints are good. And when I inspect some, you, to properly inspect the aircraft, you have to break it. Because you don't know if the glue joint is good unless you break it. So grab a hold of a gusset and hopefully it breaks. Because if the gusset comes off, you're in for a lot of work. Because then you have to pull the whole thing apart, clean it all up, and re-glue it all back together. So don't be afraid to reach in and break something. It's just wood. You can scarf it and glue it back together. With the, the holes, are, uh, I was able to space them far enough apart because I have a little bore scope that I could look into there, into the wings with. So that, that's a good thing if you can get a hold of them. They they they're pretty cheap nowadays. And uh, then you can look inside of them to see, find out where the rodents have been or not without having to poke too many holes in the wing. And uh, the scarfs that I do are a 15 to one scarf. And I do, um, when I create a scarf, I'll create, like I do the center hole first, and then I will, you know, depending on the thickness of the plywood, you measure, you do your 15 to one, measure out, and then you can draw your circle, then you know where to scarf to. And I will always try and do the patch first. It's easier to build your patch than it is to do your scarf and then try and match the patch to the scarf. So make your patch, and then you can set it on to where it's gonna go, and then you just outline it, and then you know exactly where your scarf will go to. And my go-to tool is an air angle grinder. I know that might sound a little scary, but you can remove a lot of wood real fast. <laughs> but yeah, if you aren't careful, you can go a little too fast, but it's just wood, make a little bit bigger patch if you make a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so don't be, don't be afraid, it's just wood, take some glue, and you can make another patch. And as you noticed, what I came across as a nice surprise in the wing, in the, uh, in the spar, there's a nice mouse hotel. The only way to find that, I mean, you, there's evidence of where the mice, uh, your spar will have on the back side of the spar, there should be holes in it every so often so that it can breathe and that you could see where the mice had chewed a little bit bigger hole so they could climb inside. So I had to go through with a boroscope, start where they went in and work my way down the wing until I found where the nest was. And ironically, it was in the exact same spot on both wings and it looked the exact same on both wings. So apparently that was the magic spot they hang out. And uh, like I said about removing plywood to inspect all fittings. That's what I did right there. It was perfect good plywood, it all looked just fine, but you have to remove that in order to inspect your, your fittings on the spar. And that's your most important one to inspect. Because it could be, it might look good until you get inside and actually touch the, uh, the nuts and bolts to see if they're loose or not, or if there's any sign of, um, on some fittings, um, like on, when I redid the petrol, those fittings, they, when I went to put the aircraft together, the wings would not go on. And you could have loosened up the bolts to the fittings, let it to slide on. It was maybe only like a sixteenth of an inch off at the most. But that's a key sign that something's wrong. Don't get a pry bar, don't get a bigger hammer to try and force it. That means there's something wrong. When I dug into that one, it was completely rotten underneath the fittings. You could not see it, but when I got, I actually had to use an air hammer to get the bolts out. 
and some of the bolts were almost rusted complete to nothing. So it didn't look, look just fine, but the key is, yeah, if something doesn't fit, you need to investigate. Don't just make it work. Don't get out a grinder and grind the fitting and make it fit. There's a reason why it doesn't fit. Then here's just, uh, there's a bunch of miscellaneous broken parts here and there um, on the wing that I had to, uh, to fix. It just uh, Make a patch, make a scarf, glue it together. It's the same old thing that you keep doing over and over and over on these. And the wing tips is a common place on these wing on uh, aircrafts that, because they always are touching the ground and stuff. And they, even though if it might look kind of good, it's still good to dig into the wing tip because you don't know if that's been replaced, patched, and it might be rotten inside. But this wing tip, luckily enough, it wasn't rotten on the inside, it was just ugly on the outside. So on both wings, I had to replace the tip skin on both the top and the bottom. And then you could see on the root end of the spar, there was a damaged spot to where you just cut out the damage, make a patch, scarf it, glue it back on. Then here on the ailerons, they were broken half. That uh, happened while um, one of them was, uh, one of the guys that owned it before went to do a restoration, had them sitting on a bench, something fell over and broke them both in half. And that's when he really said, I'm done. He didn't, he didn't think he had the, the knowledge to be able to repair. But really, it's actually quite easy to repair. Um, as you, and uh, here. This picture on one of them, where it was broke, it was just a little piece that I had to scarf in. And then, Down here we go where a long piece of the uh, uh, gusset that has to get glued on. And I guess the, the hardest part about it would be on the spar part. But even that isn't uh, that, that difficult to where you just cut a couple pieces, you scarf, glue them, put them in. But when I like to repair the ailerons to make sure that they work on the wing, you don't want to repair them on the bench. As you can see, I have it attached to the wing. That way I can make sure that uh, one end matches the wing itself, then the other end lines up with a tip. And you don't, otherwise if you just throw it on the bench, you think it's straight, you can you could uh, glue it together and have a twist in it. So, and for the, um, the spar area, I just glued on, when I had it setting on the wing, I actually repaired the trailing edge on the wing, and then the spar, obviously you can't completely repair that on the wing because you have to get into the D-tube of it and everything, but to hold it in place, I just glued a, just a temporary piece of plywood in place to hold it. And that's basically what's going on right here. Just, uh, just a, any kind of piece of plywood, stuck it there so it'd hold that. And then it's out, and it's also still holding it where it broke to keep that from coming apart. And then I could glue the back side of it. And then, then you could take, after that's glued together, then you could take that temporary piece off and then finish your repair. And then uh, the other two pictures are um, a picture of the gluing the, had to make new uh, ribs for the D-tube in that area, and then a new skin, and make sure you get it varnished before you glue it together in those areas, because everything has to be varnished and sealed, otherwise it will rot from the moisture and then it isn't as stable either. And uh, the other aileron, I had a little bit more repair to do to it because it had developed that twist to it. The trailing edge was uh, not very straight, so I actually had to cut out a huge chunk of the trailing edge and remove a bunch of the gussets on the ribs so that I could reposition those ribs to make it straight again. And on the wing tips, it was the same thing as or on, on the tips of the aileron, it was the same as the wings. On this aircraft, 
uh, actually the ailerons sit on the ground more than the wing does. So that's also why if you look out on at the Minimo out there, there are no blocks on the bottom side of the wing, which you see a lot of times, a block for the wing to rest on. Because actually the aileron actually hits before the wing does, so it really it rests on the aileron. So you have to be careful when you're when you land and uh, go to set the uh, wing down that you don't have that aileron facing down and it, and it doesn't hit very flat. And here's the rudder. Uh, the rudder at one point had fallen off of the trailer and gotten damaged. And it's mainly just the, the bottom part of the trailing edge. And then there is the one rib that's broken there. Then the, the top, the top skins I did replace because they were warped really bad and it would have taken a lot of filler to try and make it halfway decent looking. So it's just better just to pull the skin off and replace it. And the horizontal and the elevator, the same thing happened. They had fallen off the trailer at one point and got damaged pretty good. I had to all basically rebuild half at least half of the horizontal, because it had, it doesn't look, I mean, it's broken, but it had developed some rot with being exposed, and it, it, so I had to cut out a lot of rot in that one, so I had to re make some ribs, and in the upper middle picture there, you'll see the jigs, and I, and if, I don't know if you could tell, up in the corner of that, there are paper patterns that I was able to make off of the existing ribs on the other half of the horizontal. There's just some more parts, because I had to take off all the skins on this in order to make the repairs. And then also had to pull, take apart the center area there in order to get to the fittings. So I had to take that all apart, pull the fittings out, and the fittings I actually had to straighten out somewhat. They were, because it's a tube, a long tube through there, because the bolts have to go all the way through that to bolt it to the fuselage. And those tubes were bent a little bit. So you couldn't get, you had to almost hammer your bolts through it to get it to fasten. And there down at the lower right is where it's all completed. And here's where on the uh, elevator, having to make a, the bow for it. And it's, I take uh, the spruce and cut it into eighth inch strips. It's usually what I cut all my, when I do a bow, cut into eighth inch strips, have a pattern that you can glue against, and you need lots of clamps. I happen to have nice, uh, some nice uh, hand clamps, but you don't have to have those. Actually, a PVC tube makes really good clamps. You can get buy a different size PVC tube, and I actually do have a bunch of uh, PVC tube that I cut up and use that as a clamp. Because um, with the modern epoxy glues, you don't need high pressure. Actually, if you use too much pressure, you squish all the glue out, and then actually weakens the joint. You're better off, just, you just need a moderate pressure, because it's actually better if you actually see a glue joint. That's a strong glue joint with epoxy. You don't want it to disappear. What kind of the epoxy did you use? I use the West system. Yeah. And uh, a real common one amongst home builders and stuff is your T88. So that's one thing that you want to be sure and get with your DAR or whoever's going to sign off on your project that they know what you're using and that they will approve what you're using. And because uh, some of them, they're, you know, T88 is probably a more common amongst most of them. And it's just as good as the West system. And here's where I uh, had to yep, make all new uh, gussets for the, or ribs for the D-tube. And when I do the D-tubes, I soak my skins in hot water. I don't steam. I find it better to just soak it in hot water because sometimes steaming, if you aren't careful, especially with plywood, it'll actually dry it out and it'll crack on you. So I just make a tub 
uh, big enough. And if I do large, let's say like a, the D-tube of the wing, you don't have to soak the whole piece of plywood. You just make it big enough to where it'll just kind of curve down into the water. And then I'll cover it with plastic to hold the, the heat and then it holds the moisture in too. And then you just have to make sure that it stays submerged in the water. If a little bit of it gets towards the top, then that'll be too dry and then it'll crack on you. I made that mistake. I'm not checking some plywood once, especially these smaller pieces, because they're a little harder to keep submerged because they like to float. And I wasn't keeping an eye on it and at one end floated up. And then when I went to form it, it cracked on me. So then I had to do a new one. I just have a pressure cooker. I'm not a pressure cooker, but a turkey fryer. Turkey fryers uh, worked really good. You can use it as your steamer with take a lid, cut a hole in it, put a, a neck on it, and you can hook it to whatever you're gonna use for steaming. And then it's excellent for, it boils water really fast and you just dump it into whatever trough you made for soaking your wood. And here's the canopy, which is seeing better days, definitely. <laughs> it is the original canopy. And you can see on the inside, you can see the black mold that had uh, yeah, developed. And I couldn't use the original frame, as you see in the top far right there. It had shrunk <laughs> or just it collapsed in to where it was almost an inch off. So there's no way to use it. If to, in order to latch that, you would have had to push the canopy out in order to latch it, and that wouldn't be any fun. So I had to create a new canopy frame. And that's another thing, too, to build the canopy, since the fuselage is already built, build the canopy on the fuselage. So that's why you see it clamped together on the fuselage. That way, then, you know it will for sure fit. Don't just take measurements and try and do it on the bench. It's, uh, you'll save yourself a lot of headache. Just build it on the fuselage. The glass, as you saw, was not usable, so I had to, I, I made molds to form the glass. And to do that, I use a rigid, a, the blue rigid foam that you can order out of uh, aircraft spruce to uh, create the shape. And you have to remember that when you're creating this, well, I guess it depends on how you're going to form the glass. With the uh, shape of this, uh, it, um, I had to actually create a female mold. I had to end up with a fem female mold because it would have been too hard to form the glass on the male mold because it would have stressed the glass too much to where you'd end up cracking for sure. So when you go to make the male uh, form first, you have to make sure that you make it to the outside of the glass, not to the inside. Otherwise, it'll be a little small. And because plexiglass, after it's formed, it'll shrink a little bit anyway. So make sure you make it to the outside and not to the inside because it's easy to just shape it on the fuselage. Well, then usually the glass goes on the outside of your framework. So you have to make sure you make it just a little bit bigger. And then you, I don't know if you can see the lines on the white there. Those are shows where the glass is gonna get cut but there's an extra, if you make a mold, you have to leave at least an extra two or three inches all the way around. So you have some place, because you have to have extra glass to grab a hold of to form. So then you can cut the stuff that gets grabbed and wrecked, then you can cut that away. So you have to remember to oversize. And I, uh, to create the mold, I shaped it with the foam and then I covered it with fiberglass and then uh, bonded it smooth, and then I actually covered it um, with a gel coat, and then sanded it smooth, and you have to have it real smooth. So I ended up finish sanding it with like 1200, because it has to be perfect, because then you're gonna make your female mold off of that. And if there's any imperfections, 
when you go to form your glass, it'll show up in your glass. And the bottom right is where I started making the female mold. And to make it strong enough, and when, it gets, when this got formed, it got vacuumed at the same time. So to make this strong enough to hold up for the shaping and to be vacuumed, that's uh, 10 layers of glass, and there are different thicknesses of glass. So it takes a little bit of time, but it's well worth it in the end. And there on the top left, you can see the two molds that were made. And then next to it are clamping rings. You need, you need a nice rings to where you can clamp your glass in place to hold it. Even if it was a drape, if you were to drape over a curvature, you still need some kind of a clamping ring around the perimeter that you need to, to make to hold it in place. And then um, when I get the glass, it's oversized, obviously, and then you have to trim it. And I use either a band saw or a skill saw to cut. And you don't want real high speed when you do that, but you don't want real slow either. And you use a metal blade, as if you're going to cut your metal. The finer tooth, the better. That way it doesn't try to take a huge chunk out of the glass. And then get yourself a nice flat surface, stick a bunch of sandpaper down, and sand away. <laughs> because you don't want to try and cut too close to the line, because <laughs> it's easy to either get off, or if you do get a, sometimes when you're cutting, you can get a real small hair crack, and then you can sand it out. And then on the, you can see on the fuselage there, where I was fitting it and drilling holes and using clecos, those are basically a temporary rivet, which holds it in place as you're fitting. And then at the end result, you can see. And uh, the, it was, it's held together with soft aluminum rivets. So if you are ordering rivets, make sure you get the soft ones. If you accidentally have the hard ones, you'll destroy it in a hurry. It, it'll, you'll crack it instantly because it takes way too much pressure to compress, to compress. And anyway, the rivet will compress out and stress the glass before you actually compress it to the shape. After I do all of the repairs and I get it all sealed, then I put the whole thing together again. And at this point, you will be and have all your cables installed so that you can hook up all your controls and make sure everything works, everything fits, because you don't want to go ahead and cover it right away and go put it together and find out something doesn't fit. And the covering, I use the uh, polyfiber stitch system for doing the covering. And you'll notice the, the blue tape that kind of creates a perimeter. When I glue the fabric on, I'll actually, I lay out where my cut line is gonna be because the, the fabric does not wrap the whole entire, like the whole entire fuselage doesn't wrap around everywhere. It only covers the opening. So it'll go, I go two inches towards the leading edge and then one inch all the way around. So I will mark off where I'm gonna trim my fabric to and put tape down and then I put down a layer of thinned glue, 50-50, with either the acetone or MEK. Uh, and then I let that dry, and then I'll set the fabric onto the part, get it kind of taut. It doesn't have to be, you don't want it real tight. You just want it a little taut and trying to get rid of as many wrinkles as you can. But you don't want it too tight because you still have to shrink it. If you get it too tight and then you shrink, then you start breaking things, because it will break stuff. Um, so the, the reason why I have the glue down, then that, that gives you the perimeter of your glue, and then when I glue the fabric on, I trim the fabric with a razor blade right at the tape. I actually peel the tape up with the fabric at the same time as I trim. Then that gives you a nice, perfect, straight line. And then on the lower right there, you can see where I, to get the opaque look that you see on the glider out there, you can get the uh, poly brush and poly spray 
that's untinted. They do, so that there is the untinted poly brush that you brush on, and then after that, you'll spray on your next two coats of poly brush. And the glider and that we have sitting out here, that has a little bit more of a milky white to it. We, we wanted a little bit more white color to it, and I tinted the poly brush before I sprayed it on. I find that a little bit better than tinting the brush when you go to brush it, because then you can, you're more apt to get brush marks if you tint it at this point. You're better off to tint it before you spray it. Then you don't get any uh, brush marks. And there's the pieces of parts in the paint booth. No, you don't need a paint booth. You can uh, either hang a bunch of plastic, put a filter up in the corner, and then a fan down in the opposite corner to um, pull air through. But make sure you have a, cor a filter on the input because you don't want to suck whatever from out in your open area into on your nice finished job. And then have a fan down in the other corner. It can just be like a box fan, your regular house box fan. That's all you need. You don't doesn't need it. Just enough to move the overspray out, and then it helps keep your dust off your prop. And you can just make a simple framework out of PVC or plywood, or just hang up plastic just to keep uh, dust off of it. Fortunately, yes, I have a nice heated <laughs> paint booth, so I can uh, do this during the winter, um, which is very fortunate. Uh, and there you see the steps of the completed wing with the fabric in the paint booth, so getting ready to get primer put on it and paint. And it's real helpful if you can make yourself some kind of a dolly to put your parts on, because I can on that dolly, I can rotate that wing flat, if I, which really helps, especially if on some of your fabric areas or stuff. If, and it helps too if you aren't the greatest painter. You could paint it, then lay it flat. And if there was a little run, then it goes flat. So that's, uh, that helps if you're able to, to lay it flat. And then on the, if you're able to do it on a dolly, something similar like this, then you can get to both sides. Otherwise, if you're just using sawhorses, you paint one side, then you have to wait. So you can do that, but then you have to wait for everything to dry, then to get to the other side. And plus, it makes it a little bit easier to move around. And I do work by myself, so this really makes it easier to move the stuff around when it's on a dolly. Here's the fuselage, and it's on a dolly also to where I could rotate it, clear on its side. And it's uh, there's where it's primed and then painted down below, and then the canopy, and it's paint in the various pieces, uh, parts, and then the far corner there, lower corner, are your fittings that have been. Uh, when I uh, clean the fittings, I will use paint stripper, clean them the best you can, and then I use glass beads for blasting them. A lot of this stuff is very thin metal, so you don't want to hit it with your real abrasive sand or you'll eat through it. And I uh, powder coated all the parts. I have, uh, I bought a, a gun, made a little, little dinky booth, just enough to put a couple parts in with a fan and a filter, and then a, just a house oven that I use to bake the parts. It's, so you can powder coat your own parts. Just the larger parts, I had to take to someone else to have them powder coat it. And here are the, the pins. You can see the, what they look like at first. It's just sur surface rust. There's just a little bit of pitting, pitting, not much at all. And to clean them up, I uh, bead blast, blasted them. And then I took it to a wire wheel to shine them up. And then I nickel plated them. So that's what I have in the far right there is you make yourself a, you can make, you can buy a solution or you can make your own solution. Uh, you can buy nickel and then you dissolve it and make a solution and then you get yourself just a phone. If you have an extra phone charger, that's all it takes. Plug in your phone charger, hook up the wires and voila, watch the bubbles. Hopefully you get lots of bubbles.
And every now and again, if you do that, uh, move the part up and down, helps the uh, nickel stick. Nickel plated all the pins, and then took apart the toast, nickel plated the parts inside, cleaned them up, nickel plated them, and then put it back together. The rims, those are the original wheels for it. Cleaned those up and just repowder coated them. And then those are the original brackets and the original uh, phenolic pulleys. They were all, everything was in good enough shape to where I just had to clean them up and put it back together. There was only one pulley and one bracket that I had to make, which was the, there was a pulley at the very bottom of the fuselage right in front of the wheel for the cable to activate the brake. And that was, the two parts were, corro they had an aluminum pulley with the metal, and that was totally corroded together. So that's the only pulley that I actually had to make a pulley and bracket. And there's the instrument panel. And then the, the bottle is a, a new Winters. If you were to buy your Winters gauges, that's a new Winters uh, bottle, which is now a cardboard bottle, cardboard tube which is usually, a, they've got their logo and stuff on it, the blue and stuff like that. And I painted it black because I didn't think it looked very good with the blue cardboard bottle sitting there. And then I made uh, leather straps to strap it in place. I had to make a new skid. And, the, and on the skid, I put Delrin on the skid instead of metal. Usually you'll see metal. Uh, metal can heat up if it gets used for a long period of time and it can burn onto the wood. And actually the Delrin will hold up a lot longer than you think. The only one thing you do have to remember, if you're used to that skid stopping you, the Delrin will not stop you. <laughs> it's more like a roller skate. <laughs> It will, but it, uh, it's easily made and easily replaced. And that's a quarter inch Delrin. And it, uh, you'll be surprised how, especially with this having a wheel, that will last a long, a long time. Um, we have another glider, a Rome Buzzard, that does not have a wheel. So we are 100% landing, landing on the Delrin. And I don't know how many flights we have on that, but we have not replaced the Delrin yet. It's getting really close, but it's, and it's, and we land it on asphalt even, not just on grass. And our, we, uh, so it, you can take off and land on asphalt then with a wood skid, you put the Delrin on, on it. It's, I find it'd be a lot better than the metal. A lot easier to make too. You can use a table saw or a hand saw. You don't have to have a metal saw or anything to, to make it. And on the wheel there, you can see there's kind of a... For the brake, it's a real simple. It's just a, like the old farm machinery to stop some of the farm machinery from turning. It's just a brake material and that's all it had that goes over the top, and then when you pull on the lever, it just pulls that brake material tight against the wheel. And there she is completed, and in the air, where she belongs. That is all I have. Um, thank you, and I will turn everything over to Bert. So if we'll save our questions till the end. We'll let Bert do his talk. Thank you. So the Moa Zagatl, uh, why is it called that? There was an interesting looking cloud uh, that Moats Gottlieb, a farmer, a farmer in the countryside there uh, near the Schneider factory, the Edmund Schneider factory, he noticed that when was, the wind was very strong and in a particular direction you can read, it was a wave cloud. And he uh, relayed this to local pilots, and they were among the first to use wave lift. Okay, how about that? A nice color picture of Martin Shimp and Wolf Hurt.
It's not hearth, it's hurt. Now, if you want to see a film about the building and flying of the Moa's uh, there's a there's a YouTube thing. Come on over to the Soaring Safety Foundation booth where I hang out, and I can give you more of this presentation too. From the Moa Zagatl to the mini Moa, look at all that. You've already seen it in his shop, but that's a lot of wood, isn't it? And glue, beautiful. That was a brilliant restoration by a brilliant restorer. Don't you agree? That's the details on it. It's been flown in to records. Um, it was the first glider, apparently, to use water ballast, had a water ballast tank. And some details on the 17 meter wingspan. Um, best glide, 28 to one, and still air. <laughs> okay. Only five remain airworthy. Uh, there's two in Germany, one in Japan, one replica built in the Netherlands, and the latest one to fly in the UK. The only known Minamoa still in private ownership in the USA is the 1938, restored by Thomas Evelo, and owned by Jerry Winger, and who is here in the audience. Thank you, Jerry, for making that happen. Okay, here's a father and son story. I was invited by owner Jerry Winger and Tom Evelo at uh, the vintage meet in Lawrenceville, Illinois, down at Wabash Soaring Club. And I was so, super, super honored, <laughs> sound like a millennial, super honored to be invited to fly it. And uh, mainly because they realized this is the exact same sailplane, Minamoa, that my dad flew around 1949. So 73 years later, I get to fly it. Um, dad was a captain at Eastern Airlines, as was the owner at that time, Captain Shelley Charles. Uh, dad had a highly modified Leister Kaufman LK-10A, highly modified, which he did very well in and ended up on the world team in 1958 to Lesno, Poland to fly for the USA. Um, but they had something unique. Oh, there's mom, there's dad, and there's a little guy in the middle there around 1959. And I, was, I knew every glider in the sky because they were all different. <laughs> in other words, they weren't white with a tea tail. I grew up in a marvelous time in soaring, the golden age, but Something uh, the restorers apparently didn't know, uh, my dad, being an Eastern captain, needle ball airspeed kind of guy, along with Mr. Captain Shelley Charles, they had a uh, turn indicator and a ball bank and a squeeze bulb. And they would fly up into growing cumulonimbus, IFR, airline captains, they can switch off the ear. You know what I'm saying? You don't dare try this at home. And they would spin that doggone gyro, and then Dad said he had to switch hands once in a while. And he you know, and they, thankfully, they uh, never collided in the growing cumulonimbus, but that's my dad. So I got to fly it. And there's, I think, might have been Jerry Wilde took a picture of me uh, in flight, and my God, this is the only glider I've ever flown where you cannot see the wingtips, which is a lot of how my organic type flying is, peripheral vision. Nope, can't see them because of the gull. That doesn't matter, it flew beautifully. So there I am landing and uh, apparently I made it. Tom was there to greet me and look it over for any scratches or dings and oh my God, you know when you fly something so unique and rare and beautiful, the first thing, the last thing on your takeoff check, checklist, of course, mine is smile, breathe, and wiggle my toes. Relax and say, oh my God, don't let me screw this thing up. <laughs> That's the exact thing I said when I did a bungee launch at the Vasa Kupa on a, in an SG-38. It looks simple, but... So anyway, thank you, Jerry Winger and Thomas.